grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. One of the many blessed memories that I have as a child um, is spending time with my father as he spent time coaching. Um, my dad was a baseball coach and a basketball coach at the high school level, and so as I was growing up, I would get to go with him. I would go to practices. I would uh, ride the bus to away games when the schedule allowed for it. I would hang out behind, right behind the bench during games or even on the bench, depending on the mood of the referee that night. But one of my favorite things to do was to go with my dad as he would scout the other team. Um, he did it for baseball, but it was more involved and more important in basketball. And so we would go to the games and dad would have his notebook and he would be taking notes about uh, players and how they uh, did different things. And he would try to analyze the offense and this, that, and the other thing. My job was to keep the shot charts. So I had all of these little boxes of basketball courts and I would put an X for a make, I would put a, a circle for a miss, and we would chart to see who took the shots, where they took the shots from. And he would then take this information and try to make a plan of how to defeat the other team. When you're in competition in the sports arena, you are seeking to understand your opponents. You want to know what they are going to try to do. You want to understand how they are going to operate so that you can be prepared to play defense and to be able then to score on offense. Today I want us to look at the word to the church in Thyatira. Here Jesus is giving another warning and he uses specific images that the early church would be making connections to the Old Testament once again. In using these images, Jesus is giving the scouting report of the devil. Jesus is telling us that this is how Satan has operated in the past. This is how he is operating now, specifically in the time that the book of Revelations was written, these seven churches. And this is how he will act in the future how we deal with him still today. The image of Jesus here as he is introduced is one of importance again to this specific word to the church here in this place. The eyes are like fire. This is an indicator of his righteous judgment upon sin. God does not allow sin into his presence. Sin has to be dealt with. Sin is not entering into the throne room of heaven. Sin must always be dealt with in a righteous manner. And we see this imagery to indicate that he hasn't changed. He will not change. His word on what is and is not sinful is the standard for all of eternity. Which then leads us to his feet, like burnished bronze. Those feet don't move anywhere. They are secure. They are not going to go anywhere. And if they do get lifted up and put back down, it isn't to move, rather it is to crush. They are securely located. They are not wavering. They will not move. Jesus gives them praise. Jesus gives the church praise of their faith that they have lived, that they have seen growth in their lives, and that they continue to live. Yet Jesus says, but I have this against you. Revelation 2.20, but I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrifice to idols. There's two things that Jesus mentions here, and we will get to those in a moment. 
What we have here, though, is not a specific woman that Jesus is talking about. Rather, he is connecting us back to the Old Testament. The book of Revelation, the vision here, the words of Jesus will oftentimes connect us back to the Old Testament and say, look at this to help us have a fuller understanding of what I am speaking about. The connection is back to 1 Kings 16 through 19 where we get a picture of what Satan has done in the past, what Satan was doing in the church at Thyatira, and what he continues to do in the here and now. The goal of Satan is always for people to worship false gods. That is always the goal of Satan. That is his desire, for people to turn away from the one true God and turn to a false god, whatever you want to call it, whatever the name of that false god might be, if it's not the one true God, if it's not God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, if it is not that God, the true God, then Satan has claimed victory. In 1 Kings, Ahab marries Jezebel. And he begins to serve not only Yahweh, but he begins to serve Baal and worship Baal. Baal was considered to be the one who controlled the rain. So we have no shortage of rain, right? As a farming community in this time period, no rain meant no what? No food. No rain, no food. So there was a connection to real life stuff. For all the false worship, for all the false worship of the Old Testament people that they would fall into, I do credit them for understanding that God played an intimate role in their lives, a direct role in their life, not something far off, not something that he will simply get me to heaven, that God was there every day, every hour, every minute, and God was involved in the lives of the people. I give them credit, but they looked to the, all the wrong places. Baal, this god of fertility, was involved with Asherah. And when they consummated their relationship, it would rain and it would give life. This was the thought process. This is what was understood of how Baal operated. The worship practice was to act out in the temple what the people wanted Baal and Asherah to do. And so worship consisted of temple prostitution. This is a scouting report on Satan. This is a scouting report on Satan. His go-to move is to try to get you to abandon your faith or compromise your faith will always will oftentimes and I'm, I've been chewing on this the, this entire week often I say often I want to hedge my bets a little bit but I'm I am I am continuing to think that it almost always will involve two areas revolving around pleasure and provision. Satan's go-to move is always revolving around pleasure and provision. Clearly, in the midst of the church at Thyatira, there was immoral behavior taking place. And likely in this time, it was even wrapped up in false worship, just like it was in the day of Ahab and Jezebel. Christ says a word to this church. Christ calls them to repentance with the warning that he will judge this unrepentant sin. Not, in a, not, not the attitude of, well, I know you love me, even though you are unwilling to stop your sinful behavior and at your core, this idolatrous behavior, I know you still love me, even though you are unwilling to repent. And that's not the attitude of Christ in Revelation. It's not the attitude of Christ in the Gospels, but it's spelled out very clearly for us here in the book of Revelation. The message of Jesus is never, it's okay to accommodate your lives in order to get the things that you want as long as you still say, I love you, Jesus. That's never the message of 
the scriptures. We don't get to have Jesus and then do whatever we please. But I want you to recognize that there is also an other incorrect understanding that sometimes comes along with this teaching. For many thought or have thought in the past that the life of a Christian is one where you are walking and if you sin, now you are outside the kingdom and you have to, you have to make some type of amends or repent or be forgiven in some tangible, specific place in order to get back into the kingdom. And it's this bouncing back and forth. Ooh, I, I sinned today, and so I need, I need something to get back into, into the kingdom. That is also a misunderstanding. Because what does Jesus say here? He talks to his servants. He talks to his people. And he says, if you continue to persist in your unrepentant ways, then I will bring my judgment upon you. It's not, oh, I sinned today, I better get back into the kingdom of God before Jesus comes back or before I die. That's not what is being said here. But what is being said here is if you continue in your unrepentance, that will have consequences. And it's holding these two things in tension when we hear these words from Jesus. Satan will often attack. But he attacks not in a way that comes directly at our faith. Satan is smarter than calling us to full out deny Jesus, at least at the very beginning. The temptation to worship both Baal and Yahweh, because Satan knows that that is not acceptable to Yahweh, is his approach. Satan knows not to have people directly deny faith in Jesus. Rather, he begins to introduce things that mix in with Jesus because he knows that is unacceptable to Christ. He knows that is unacceptable to God, and he knows that that will eventually take hold and it will be faith-destroying. When a basketball team has played their opponent multiple times, they know what the other team is going to do. You know their offense. You know this guy goes here, this guy goes here, there's going to be a screen here. And so what the opponent will oftentimes do is they begin to make adjustments, right? They begin to try to disguise what they are attempting to do, yet the players are the same. The guy who makes a lot of shots from the one spot on the court is still trying to get a shot from that same place. He just might try to get there slightly different. The screen might be in a different spot, but he's still trying to accomplish the same thing by doing really pretty much exactly the same act. That's what we have with Satan. He doesn't change his stripes he might try to disguise them, but he has his strengths and he continues to go to them. He continues to try to get us to mix something in with our faith. He attempts to be sneaky. The children go to college and come home with a new religion? Probably not. Do people start worshiping a new God when they leave the church? Not exactly. Does a fairly faithful Christian marry someone who doesn't have the same faith or at least doesn't live out a confession of faith and say, I don't believe anymore? Not usually. Do people reject Jesus by name? No, not at all. And in fact, they will utilize his name to undermine the very Jesus that that name represents. Satan uses pleasure and provision to invite a syncretistic approach to people's lives. Then when the hooks 
are in, when the hooks have gotten a piece of us and they are in us, then Satan pounces. The temptation of pleasure is most obviously in sexual relationships because it's actually how we were created. It's actually part of how God designed humanity. Our brains and our bodies are created for that sexual act to be the highest form of pleasure when one is experiencing it. It's why it is such a powerful bonding agency within the context of marriage. And it is why it is so destructive outside the context of marriage. You can actually back this up by science. Not simply what the Bible says, but we shouldn't be surprised when the Bible is actually affirmed by what we actually know in how things work according to science. It is a powerful, powerful thing, and so it is also a powerful temptation because Satan has a tendency to take what God creates, to twist it, and to use it to his own evil ends, his own evil purposes. We have come to think that something that makes me feel good now must in fact be good, and anything that brings the opposite of pleasure must be bad. That is not what Christ taught, yet it is how we oftentimes operate. So often people seek pleasure of all sorts, all sorts, sexual and everything else that is wrapped up in this pleasure of our, of, of our being, and they will seek it to their very own death, both physically and spiritually. That's what addiction is. They will seek it and seek it and seek it and seek it until it actually destroys you. Provision is the other common way that Satan attacks and, and, and tempts. The account of the Old Testament has disgusting sinful behavior described there. Yet it is all done with the thought that it was so that we can eat, so that we can be provided for. Provision is a tool of Satan that always seeks to use to get you to look away from the only place that our provision comes from, and that is God Almighty. To look to another location for our provision. And instead of it being wrapped up in idol worship, in temple worship that we see in the Old Testament, that we see in the early church, it has been repackaged in another thing. It has been repackaged in another way in our society. And so it is even more insidious because we say, oh, it isn't, it's not us worshiping some false god. It's just how the world works. But Satan's goal is always to never have us look to where our true provision comes from every single day, and that is God Almighty. He desires us to look to anything other than God. So one side of the aisle says, look to the government. They will give you your stuff that you need. They will give you your protection. They will do for you all that you could have ever imagined. And you might be saying, yeah, I got them. The other side of the aisle is, says, look to yourself. Pull up your bootstraps, work harder, work more hours, work hard, do this, do that, and then you will be provided for. Then you will be worthy to receive the things that your heart could ever desire. But notice who isn't being looked to on either side. God Almighty. Where the true provisions actually come from. This is the move that Satan makes throughout history. Pleasure and provision. Look to anything other than where God has placed these things for you. That is his goal. The temptation continues to come. 
why both pleasure and provision are such effective tools is that they are both good things if they are found in the right places. They are both good things if they are found where God has placed them. So often, though, they are found in all the wrong places. And when Satan will often use these things to tempt us and we succumb to that temptation, what we will oftentimes find is that we begin to be consumed with guilt. We begin to be consumed with shame. And Satan knows exactly how that works. And so what does he do? He says, here, have a little more pleasure to soothe your guilt. Have a little bit more pleasure to soothe your shame. Have a little bit more provision to make the conscience go quiet. And he slowly chokes. He slowly chokes people because we forget where we need to be looking for all things that are good, including the very forgiveness of our sins. When we succumb, when we have failed, when we have fall, when we do these things, we need to be reminded that our Savior comes, yes, with a word, a righteous word, but he comes with a word of repentance. Turn away from what you are succumbing to and turn to Christ and find his grace that is there for you. Turn away and be saved from the, the consequences of our sins. He says, turn away from them. Come to me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come to me and you will find forgiveness. Come to me, walk in my ways to the glory of my holy name, and things will go well for you. Your conscience will be clear. Your hope will be secure in Jesus Christ alone. Not in your pleasure. Not in your provision. But in God Almighty himself. So, Brothers and sisters, this is the scouting report of Satan. Anytime that we are finding pleasure in this life, anytime we are finding provision in this life, we must always be aware that it can be taken, twisted, and used to our demise. But we can also know that all good things from God are for our good when we listen to his word. And when we fail, when we stumble, if there are things in our lives, we know that Jesus comes to us and says, repent. Come and receive my forgiveness. In Jesus' name.